am pleased tonight to introduce uh, the Summer Writers Read author. His name is Bill Hillman, and he is a writer whose work is vivid with the geography of Chicago land. Characters race through the Jewel parking lot, read the headlines in the Trib, enlist streets, tollways, and parishes by nicknames familiar only to insiders. Novelist Joe Mino writes, Bill Hillman's The Old Neighborhood is like a right hook to the chin with brass knuckles, crackling with bravery and urgency. Hillman, whose work has appeared in Salon.com and was broadcast on NPR, is also the author of a new memoir, Mozos, a decade running with the Bulls of Spain. He grew up in Edgewater. He earned an MFA from Columbia College Chicago and a bachelor's from Elmhurst College. But what's special to us tonight is he's a former College of DuPage student and a union construction laborer who has run with the Bulls in Pamplona and fought his way to a Chicago Golden Gloves championship. We are delighted to welcome him tonight to read from his work. And when he is finished, he will take questions. We know you are a small but enthusiastic audience. So how about a round of applause for the author? That is like my favorite introduction. I heard that earlier today too. It's just, and fought his way to a Golden Glove championship. It's wonderful. I'm gonna use that in all my bios from now on. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's, it's great to be back at COD. Um, it was, if it wasn't for COD, I, none of this would have happened. You know, I would never become a writer. Um, I never would have started on this path. Um, it was, my dad, he had always wanted me to, to read Ernest Hemingway, but I, I was always reluctant, you know. I never really had the attention span for reading until uh, in, at COD here, I chose to take uh, a class on Hemingway. And uh, Jackie's father, David McGrath, was the teacher. And uh, he was just this like really enigmatic, sort of charism charismatic guy who was really passionate about Hemingway and uh, the old man in the sea. And, uh, he started to sort of uh, explain these metaphors that Hemingway was working for uh, in, uh, in The Old Man and the Sea. And uh, I was, it just blew my mind, you know, I never really understood literature until that class. I never really understood what a metaphor was until I was there. And, um, you know, it started to really inspire me because Ernest Hemingway wrote so much about like the, the common man, you know, fishermen, um, you know, soldiers, um, people that I felt like I, I could see people that I knew in these characters. And um, I felt like he was just writing, like he was a perfect writer for me to read at that point in my life. And, um, you know, I sat down and I, I uh, a few months after his class, and uh, I read uh, The Sun Also Rises. And I was so enthralled by it, I read it in one sitting. And when I finished that book, I decided I was gonna be, devote my life to literature, that I was gonna become a writer, and I was gonna go to Spain and run with the Bulls. And so here we are, you know, 15 years later, and uh, a lot's happened since, and it's, it definitely transformed my life. Um, my debut novel uh, came out about, what is it, about 14 years after uh, that class with David McGrath. Um, it's basically, it's a fictionalization of my, my childhood um, based on some of the events, um, but also you know, a lot of fiction in it as well. Um, I'm gonna read uh, from one of the opening passages. Uh, the main character at this point in the novel, Joe Walsh, is nine years old. And uh, his older brother is deeply involved in uh, street gangs in the neighborhood. And there's a war going on in the neighborhood between his gang and another gang called the Assyrian Kings. And the kings have sent over someone with a gun. To the, to the carnival where we're, we're all hanging out. And uh, this happens. The gunshot was abrupt. It sent a torrent of reactions to the mass of people. Some of the hoods dove under the folding tables. Father McHale smirked and jammed both his index fingers in his ears like it was a firecracker. No one seemed to know which direction it had come from. I saw it though, the fire from the barrel. I watched little Pat run and jump the beer garden fence in the direction of the tall, skinny Assyrian kid who held the pistol to his leg. 
A line of gray smoke leaked from the barrel and slithered up his wrist. The confusion continued as the Assyrians sprinted down the alley with Lil' Pat and Mickey giving chase close behind. Ryan and I darted after them as they ran down the alley and turned right. A wild menacing laughter erupted from Lil' Pat and Mickey. I glanced at Ryan sprinting beside me. He looked as scared as I felt. We ran as fast as we could, but they pulled away from us as we turned to the tee in the alley. Their shoes clapped the pavement as my Jordans slipped on the dusty, pebble-ridden concrete. They sprinted across Ashland Ave and through the Jewel parking lot. Ryan and I crossed Ashland. A rusty pickup truck honked its horn as we cut in front of it. My heart banged in my ears. Across the half-empty parking lot, the Assyrian disappeared through the front door of the pharmacy with little Pat and Mickey giving chase close behind. The laughter rose to high hilarity. As we approached the pharmacy, I heard the screams from inside, but no gunshot. We stood there at the open door as the neon green light from the sign in the window poured out and stained the sidewalk at our feet. We peered in at the long rows of shelving units that ran back to the counters. There wasn't a soul in sight, just the screams and a deep leaden crunching. Then the sound dampened. The laughter plummeted to a bubbling demonic gurgle. There was a blur of motion. Ryan grabbed my arm and pulled me toward another doorway. We crammed in and pressed our backs to the glass door. Little Pat emerged from the drugstore with Mickey right behind him. Their laughter fizzled to a popping giggle. Their hands were red as butchers to the forearms and there was a bulge in Lil' Pat's blood-speckled waistband. As they jogged out, Lil' Pat's shirt rose up above his belt and I saw the wet wooden pistol grip. They glanced up and down Clark Street wild-eyed and then hung a left and disappeared into the darkness of the side street. The screaming continued inside. It was a woman's voice and it was the only voice that could be heard. There was a quick panting between each scream. I listened as I hid there with Ryan beside me. Our chests heaved. The patter of little Pat and Mickey's steps dissipated. We entered the drugstore wordless. The woman screamed like she was falling into an endless black abyss. It rang in my ears. Trembling, we walked towards it. I saw the dark red puddle on the floor slowly expanding like a shadow across the green gray tiles. I walked closer to the puddle's edge where I saw the young man motionless eyes still open. A deep crack above his eye ran up his forehead into his hairline. Thick blood oozed slow from the wound, wetting his frizzy black hair. His bottom jaw hung open and was cocked to the side of his narrow dark face like it had been dislodged from its hinge. The woman screamed deeper into the abyss, crumbled on the ground with the phone trembling in her hand. Her torso shook terribly. The puddle enveloped her legs and soaked the underside of her brown nylons. I looked at them in silent mourning for the young man and for something I hadn't words for. We slipped out of the store as the others poured in through the doorway. We walked towards home in the quiet, our heads hung, the weight of it all around us. The air was thick and the carnival roared on in the distance. The sound of the children's joyous screams rose and fell, but I had no urge to return. We walked down Clark to Hollywood Ave, where the yellow sign of the store glowed stale and flickering. We stood under it a while. You think they're gonna get caught up? I asked. Nah, ain't nobody gonna rat them out. Shit, he was dead, wasn't he? Ryan didn't answer. We walked down and crossed Ashland with the sirens floating in the air. Ryan went his way to the north and I went home. I went up to my room and sat on the bed a while in the dark as the orange yellow of the street light seeped in through the window. I thought about God. I thought about heaven and if little Pat could ever go there now. I wondered if I could go there now that I knew what I knew and was never gonna tell. I held my crucif crucifix and prayed to Jesus that he wasn't dead. After the others had gone to sleep, I went downstairs to the TV room 
and watch the reports of the murder. And now's the birth of Pistol Pat. So that's the opening passage um, of the novel. Um, Joe uh, sort of, the, the novel follows Joe into early adulthood, early mid-teens or so. And, um, you know, the book uh, was very lucky with it. Um, it uh, it received a lot of attention, a lot of acclaim, won some awards, and um, it's really a dream come true. Um, enter the, the bull running. <laughs> so about, about three years after I, re I read the, the Sun Also Rises, I traveled to Spain for the first time and uh, to run with the bulls. And I basically did everything wrong you could do wrong. I, uh, I got pickpocketed the first night because I was sleeping on the streets. Uh, I, when I tried to run, I got, I got pushed off the, the course by the police because I was standing in the wrong place. I luckily found my way back onto the course and ended up being able to run. And uh, it was an intense experience. Um, but I probably never would have come back to Spain if it wasn't for something that I witnessed on the, um, on the third morning that I was there. Uh, there was a terrible, uh, bloody run that happened. I was watching from a balcony above and a bull uh, locked onto uh, a runner and followed him to the wall. The runner fell and the bull just started to gore him um, really terribly. Gored him in the stomach, picked him up, slammed him into the wall, uh, gored him in the face. Gored him in, in the leg. Um, it was clear that the animal was going to kill him if it continued any longer. And everyone on the street, all the other runners, were trying to distract this bull. There's hundreds of people coming to his aid, trying their best, you know, waving the newspaper, you know, patting the bull on his back, trying to get him to stop. When uh, this great runner named Miguel Angel Perez showed up, and uh, he grabbed hold of the bull's tail. And when that happened, the bull stopped, stopped going this man and uh, started looking back at Miguel <laughs> like who is this guy that's got my tail <laughs> and Miguel sort of held him for a moment the, the, run the runner who was gored crawled away bleeding from all over his, his clothes torn to pieces um, the bull sort of followed him a little bit but then he stopped and, and Miguel sort of distracted him with his newspaper and the bull kind of turned with, with the newspaper and Miguel just just got the bull's attention and just led him up the street and out of sight. And to this day is one of the greatest things I've ever seen. You know, one human being coming to the aid of another, risking their life and saving their life, saving that, that person's life. Um, it was incredible. And when I saw that, I knew right then that there was more to just like a chaotic adrenaline rush. You know, there was, a, there was an art, there was a code of conduct, there was a method of, of sort of interacting and, and communing with the animal, and that there was heroism, you know, on the street. Um, it was more than, you know, that, that little blip uh, on CNN every year, you know, of, of the run, bulls running through the street. And uh, I knew that I wanted to learn this tradition and I wanted to become one of them. And uh, over the next 10 years, I began to really learn the tradition and uh, I ended up running with Miguel and El Perez several times and, you know, very, very uh, lucky and, and was on TV a lot over there and um, it was an incredible journey. And so after this book, after my novel came out, I decided I needed to, to write a memoir about that, that 10 years. And I started work on it. Uh, my publisher wanted it. And um, then after two years working on it, um, I was, I ended up having an altercation with a bull on the street. And I'll read a little bit of that passage from the, from the opening of the book. I fell to the zigzag bricks flat on my back, astonished at how the glory unraveled so quickly. A mozo had dropped his knee into my chest and my leg popped up in recoil. The 1200 pound bull swooped in, his foreleg collapsed as he swung his head low and graceful. The point of his horn struck my inner thigh. I felt a needle prick, then a vast universe of nothing. 
He lifted me in a majestic lunge. My legs sailed between the planks of the barricades. No pain. I grabbed my crotch and thought, thank God it's not my balls. I really want to have kids one day. <laughs> the horn slid out. I fell to the coarse bricks again. I scampered out on my backside. Then the medics pulled me through and for a moment I was alone. I looked down at the baseball sized fleshy wound, half expecting it not to be there. What have you done to yourself? Mid-thigh, a deep gouge gaped open with the skin torn in three triangular ribbons like undone wrapping paper. Blood streaked down the backside of my calf from the second hole and filled my shoe. I peered into the deep mangled flesh like a concave bloody eye and a voice inside me calmly said, accept it, you knew this day would come. So that's, uh, that's the opening passage. Um, you know, a lot of things happened after that. Um, I contributed to a survival guide on the running of the bulls. And uh, a lot of journalists all over the world thought it was really funny that a survival guide author was almost killed by a bull. So uh, it ended up becoming a big media storm. Um, I was on the cover of the Times of India, uh, the Toronto Star, Washington Post. Uh, I wrote op-eds for them. Um, it was really surreal, but uh, as uh, as all that happened, you know, I just kept, uh, you know, I took every interview. Anyone who called got an interview. Um, I talked with CNN. I talked with the Today Show. Um, everyone, and slowly but surely, the story just kept sort of turning and twisting, and uh, eventually, my my debut novel, which was this quest that I've been on for over a decade. Uh, became an internationally acclaimed novel. And people, about, people read about it and knew about it all over the world. And my dream came true as an author. And um, so it was really probably one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me, in a way. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's been an incredible journey and none of it would have happened if it wasn't for Professor David McGrath and COD, which, uh, I'm very grateful for. So thank you guys so much. Had you been a, a reader before you got in this class? No. No. I had, uh, I was going to go into physics. So I read like, like several chapters from a few books on physics that I was really interested in. But I, I was really stubborn. You know, if something didn't interest me, I'd just put it right down. And I, and I, so I'm not going to waste my time reading something I'm not interested in. And uh, I think in, in, in high school and in, it, you know, I just, I never really picked up a book that really interested me. I mean, the, the Outsiders kind of did, but there was already a movie, so I just watched the movie, you know. Um, you know, it, it, it was, it's, it's terrible, you know, that how lazy I was. But I, I think that's a lot of, a lot of kids are that way, you know, with video games and movies, there's so many things to distract them. It's such like an instant gratification these days that um, it really took uh, someone who was passionate about literature, who, who I could, who I could relate to, you know, like David McGrath was a guy that like, I want to go have a beer with or something, you know, I could like, I could be friends with this guy. He was cool. He was, he was excitable. He was interesting. Uh, you know, and, and when he started talking about literature, when he started talking about Hemingway, and this whole like uh, uh, symbolism and the old man in the sea with this, uh, this the, the crucifix and, and how Hemingway was trying to elude and, and, and make a metaphor out of uh, this, this incredible fishing adventure into like a, a Jesus, a Christ symbol. Um, you know, I was like, wow, you know, this is amazing. Uh, he did it with a couple other stories too. I remember uh, he was like white elephants, you know. There was a lot of, of, of metaphor, symbolism that he was drawing out of it that I never would have saw it, you know? That was the interesting thing is like, I read these passages and I was like, whatever, it's just some people at a train station, like, you know, like what? Like, oh, it's a guy who caught a big fish, you know? <laughs> like, great, just, I guess that means he should win the Nobel Prize. But uh, when David started like, don't you see, like you have to see, this is, this is, 
great literature like like I mean, he wasn't even like over the top like that it was like it just but it oozed like the power of it like oozed out of him when he talked about it and um i was like this is awesome i i can't believe that i could read something and get nothing from it and then have turn around and have someone explain it to me and, and get so much out of it you know i'd get shivers in his class listening to him talk about it and um you know it just it, it made me want to read and I still want to read to this day, you know? It's just, it's a lifelong love of reading that he really instilled in me, and uh, it's priceless. So how do you go from not reading to being turned on by a faculty member or teacher to knowing that you could do something like that? I mean, most of us read Hemingway and we think, okay, this guy's way out of our league, but how did you have the confidence or what happened along the way? What would you tell to somebody wants to write but doesn't have the confidence that they should do or seek out to do stand up like you are well you know it's it's one of those things is i've always really believed in myself uh i've always been incredibly stubborn too i love when people tell me i can't do something this is the best like you think i can't do that i'm gonna know i have to do it and and that's always been for me you know that uh, I've always been driven by those kind of things and, and those kind of like, you know, emotions of like, I want to be great like Hemingway, you know? Well, all right, let's go, I'm gonna go do it. You know, I don't know how, you know, and I'm not there yet for sure, but I feel like I'm on that path and I'm, I'm gonna stay on that path. And, and I think, uh, you know, for, for kids, you know, I, I just, what I would say is basically believe in yourself. You know, you can do anything you want, as long as you're willing to put the work in. Um, you can, I mean, here's me. I mean, in my freshman year of high school, I almost was, I was like on the verge of dropping out. I was on the verge of being kicked out for bad grades. You know, if you, if, if you told my freshman teachers that I was gonna get an MFA in literature and in, in writing, they would laugh out loud. If, if I met them today and, and, and they remembered me from when I was a freshman, they would just be, just they would be they'd be speechless but uh that's the thing is that you know the human spirit is incredibly powerful and if you if you believe in it and you're willing to to put in the work and, and be resilient you know because it's so hard i mean especially when you're working full-time and things like that to try to pursue a creative endeavor like like writing you know i've always worked you know construction since i was going to school here you know and um it's tough, you know, but you gotta make the time. It's gotta be important to you. If it's not important to you, you're never gonna do it. And if you're not, if you're not willing to fail, you know, that's the other thing is a lot of kids get afraid of failure, you know. And failure's hard, you know, rejection's hard. And, um, but it makes you incredibly strong if you're willing to just plow through it. And almost, you almost have to enjoy it. You know, you almost have to like, like look it in its eyes. Like when you're in, when you're in like a workshop or something and like some, you know, student is, is, is critiquing your work or even a professor and they're, they're really going after your work. You know, you just almost gotta just like, like stand up a little tall and look them in the eyes and just absorb it because that's the thing that's gonna drive you to, to be successful is, is that sort of, those emotions that they bring out in you, they'll be, I don't know, shame or, or humiliation or anger or all those emotions. If you take those and all that powerful emotion and put it into the work, you will, you will excel. There's no question. You will excel. And I've been doing that for years and years. And it's, and it's gotten me a lot of good results. Are you working on something now, a new project? Yeah, well, I started my sequel to The Old Neighborhood, um, but I'm, I'm planning on, uh, because it, it takes, it's a lot of work to really sell a book and to get out there and do events and stuff and to make, to make, your, to make your book a financial success, you know, a business, a functioning business. It's just, it consumes all your time. So I'm really not, uh, I'm not gonna focus on my sequel until probably, probably uh, late winter next year. And then I'm gonna sit down and write the entire novel and, um, and, start, and start the rewriting and, and start getting into that. But from here till then, I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna put together a one man show that's uh, gonna be storytelling. And because uh, so much of Mozo's is, is the journey of writing the old neighborhood, um, I'm gonna be able to sort of, sort of play on both books and, and create this sort of, uh, this, this one man show that sort of explores my journey to becoming a writer and, and to becoming a bull runner and to becoming a better person really. 
So that's gonna be kind of my focus and just doing events, you know, I'm gonna do the, I'm gonna do East Coast, West Coast, I'm gonna probably do Mexico, I'm gonna do Europe, um, you know, I'm gonna do everything I can, you know, any opportunity I get, like if CNN calls me up, I'm, I'm flying to, to Washington DC and do, do the interview, you know, I, I'm gonna go all the way for it. And I know that I can't really focus on the writing during that time um, of, a, of a serious novel, you know, I can get the play together, I think. Um, because I got a really good idea and I told all these stories. I have all these stories I can just put together and I'm a pretty good performer So I know I can pull it off, but uh Yeah, so for the next for the next uh Six months or so I'm gonna be focused on selling this book and getting that one-man show off the ground and and focus on just Doing the most I can for for the book Do you want to tell them about the documentary? Sure, sure. There's a documentary. I'm a character in um, It's uh, you know, it's called Chasing Red it's a really beautiful film. Um, this, this Disney, uh, this filmmaker from Disney, he, he basically uh, did some freelance work for, for this documentary. And he is gorgeous. It's some of the most beautiful images of the running of the bulls I've ever seen. And um, my, they did a real nice job with my character. You know, my characters really, they make me look really interesting and, and poetic and cool. So I'm really happy with it. Uh, <laughs> They kind of they kind of put a spotlight on the, my my falls and tumbles, which I was a little hurt by, but that's okay. It still makes me more compelling, you know. You gotta be more if you get hurt, you're more compelling, you know. So, uh, but it's it's a beautiful film. You should look at it. You should look it up. And uh, it's been screening all over the country, all over the world. So, what's the one thing you did to get this national attention? Um, I mean, a lot of people want to be where you're at. Yeah, you gotta get gored by a bull. You know, just go over there. When the bulls come, just jump in front of them and they'll gore you and then you'll be a bestseller. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be on CNN. No, you know, it's, uh, I was incredibly, like I said, I mean, I was incredibly lucky to, to, for all of it, you know. I mean, it's, it, it's as horrible an experience as it was, you know, and hard on it. It was very hard on my wife and my marriage, but at the same time, I feel like we're much closer today than we ever were. You know, she's sitting here in front, you know, She's my biggest fan and supporter, and uh, I love her more today than I ever have. And it's a, uh, it, it really honestly was, uh, it was wonderful karma, if that makes any sense. You know, I'm a Buddhist, and um, they teach you sometimes when, when, when things, terrible things happen, it, they happen, they're actually maybe the, the, the greatest blessing in your life. And I really think this, that's what this was. And they really, uh, it allowed me to, you know, I'm, I probably shouldn't jinx myself because they might not accept it, but, uh, you know, I'm working on a op-ed for the most important publication in the world right now because of the Goran. You know, it's just, it's one of those things that uh, you, you really, you got to sort of be able to see, see the goodness in, 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 the, in the bad. You know, if the light gives you, you know, lemons, make lemonade, you know. I got gored, I made a book about being gored, and CNN's already been talking about it, you know. I, I uh, you know, it's, it's, you got to just make the best out of everything that comes, you come across in life. And the bad stuff, I tell you, is it's usually either makes you stronger or ends up being something really good for you. Go ahead. Well, I was hearing undertones of like a spiritual journey almost, and then you finally mentioned this Buddhism. Was it a spiritual journey for you as well, going through all of this, or growth, or...? Oh, yeah. It was incredible. I mean, the, the book is really just, it is about like the spiritual growth and, and the evolution of me as a, as a person. You know, I was very troubled, incredibly troubled when I first started running with the Bulls. I mean, you wouldn't believe, you wouldn't recognize me. I mean, I was a very, very troubled person. And today, you know, I'm I'm pretty, I'm doing okay, you know, but I'm okay. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect, but I'm okay. My wife even will admit that I'm okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, especially the going was, was incredibly intensely a uh, spiritual journey for me. You know, it was, you know, when I, when I woke up, when I go, well, I didn't, I didn't go to sleep luckily, but uh, when I got out of surgery, um, you know, I got online and I was trending. My name was trending everywhere. Thousands and thousands of people were talking about me. And most of them were saying really nasty things about me or joking about me or making fun of me. And then I opened my email and I had dozens of emails from perfect strangers, you know, saying, hi, I heard what happened. I hope you die. 
you know, and these, these, these horrible things they were saying to me. And, and when I looked through some, some of the journalists, the, Washington, the Huffington Post, you know, they, they wrote this, uh, this, this really attacking article on me and, and, you know, said that the bull delivered a great form of force of karma when it gored me, you know, and I was, it was, and the, and the title of it was, we swear we're not laughing. You know, which which is I mean is is a terrible thing to do to somebody who's seriously injured, but uh, you know, I started to bicker with people online from my hospital bed, and I'm like fighting with them, like you know, lashing out at them, and I'm getting furious because they're writing me back, and it's getting worse and building and building. And my wife's like, "You have to stop. You have to sleep. You know, you're 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 seriously injured. You need to sleep." I'm on like I'm on like IV antibiotics and, and I'm on morphine. You know, I'm in I'm in serious medical. I'm in a, in, I'm in a life and death situation. I'm, I have an infection in my leg that could kill me, and I'm still bickering with people on this phone that I, my friend gave me. And uh, you know, finally I did just say, like I realized like I was getting sicker the more that I fought. I could feel the infection growing and spreading through my body. Literally, the more angry I got, the more I fought. And then I just told myself I had to just, I had to just forgive them. And um, as soon as I did that, uh, I had lost my bag with all my stuff, my medication, my, my Gohanza, my Buddhist talisman that I'm supposed to pray to every day, my computer. As soon as I forgive those people, a woman called me from the lost and found in Pamplona, said she saw me on television and she said she had my bag. So I got everything back, stuff that was irreplaceable, you know. The Gohanza that I'm supposed to have to my death, I'm supposed to have it. As soon as I got it back, I hung it and I started praying for everybody that lashed out at me online and everybody that said they wished I would have died, they, they hope I die. Every one of them, I just prayed for them until I was exhausted and I laid down. And, and as I was praying for them, I felt like these incredible like swirls like going through my body, through my leg and through my, through my chest and my, I was getting shivers and I, I had this, uh, and I knew that I was healing myself by forgiving them. And um, I never look back. I know, I've never once looked back at any of those comments. And I just, things, have, things in my life have just gone really well since then. And, and the, the story around the world went from being this horrible joke to being this really in-depth, fascinating piece about some American guy's love for this Spanish tradition, this ancient tradition, and how it changed his life. And, um, you know, I, as a journalist, my publication, uh, you know, I had been on the Tribune level, you know, the Washington Post and the Toronto, the Toronto Star, you know, the, the publication that Hemingway went to Spain to write for, you know, asked me for an op-ed. I wrote a 1500 word op-ed for them. The cover of the section, you know, was, was the story. And uh, my dreams just continue to come true one after the other since then. And uh, I really think it all goes back to me forgiving those people. Because if I hadn't forgiven them, I don't know what would have happened. I might, I might have done, lashed out really badly and then it would have got worse and, and it made it led to more negative stories about me. You know, who knows what would have happened? But uh, it, definitely, it definitely was a key turning point in my life. You have a remarkable connection to Hemingway and he has, a, he has a very unique style, minimalism, right? And so um, he's the only writer to win the Nobel Prize that wrote at an eighth grade reading level because he has this, you know, kind of very simple, rhythmic, iconic way of writing. Um, and I just started in your memoir, and um, do you feel like you've inherited that style a little bit? I mean, and, and also, and I just ask you about this too, because, you know, Hemingway was, um, pretty caught up in machismo and all that kind of, you know, um, um, masculinity and everything. How do you deal with all of that stuff? That's the first question. And the second question, are there other writers that later have come in and uh, been important to you? Okay, yeah, I mean, the Hemingway style, you know, part of, part of probably why I enjoyed it so much because it was so simple and powerful, you know, and my vocabulary was terrible when I started reading, so if, it was, if I was reading Faulkner, I probably would have had to put it down because I wouldn't understand half the words, you know, but, uh, yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely, I, I definitely embrace the, uh, the simple, the simplistic sort of style, but I also, I use big words, too, I mean, you know, I, I don't, I don't feel, I'm not married to it, necessarily, um, you know, he's, 
you know, he, he, he basically one of the most influential writers in American literature. So everybody really has got to, you know, make a little nod to Hemingway. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, a lot, I'm a lot more imagistic in my fiction, especially than Hemingway. I'm more, you know, Hemingway was very imagistic early on, in his, especially in his short stories. He was way more imagistic and, and you know, he did a lot more, a lot, a lot more on the page uh, than he did, you know, more in his, in his later life and in his novels. Um, and uh, so, in a way, I was I'm, I'm influenced by early Hemingway and and later Hemingway. Um, as far as the masculinity stuff, you know, I think it's really it, Hemingway is a fascinating guy. Have you ever read uh, Garden of Eden? I mean, that is a really really out there book. I mean, about basically about gender, you know, gender role reversals, uh, you know. Messing around with gender and, and, and sexuality and, uh, you know, wait, I mean, I understand why it wasn't published after he died. I mean, it was, it was out there, you know. And my friend, uh, who happens to be uh, Ernest Hemingway's grandson, John Hemingway, he wrote a book called Strange Trap, which kind of documents sort of his father and Hemingway and, and how they, um, you know, his father, Gregory, saw, saw Ernest once. As, as when, when Gregory was a child, he saw Ernest dressed up as a woman one night. And Ernest couldn't deal with it at the moment. He kind of just shut the door. But uh, later he came and tried to explain it to him. And he just said, you know, son, we're, we're from a strange tribe. You know, and that, that's why he chose that for the title. And um, Gregory went on to become a cross-dresser. And he also got a partial sex change um, before he died in, uh, in a tragic accident. Um, you know Hemingway's sexuality and, and all this idea of masculinity is, is so fascinating. You know his whole idea, like the iceberg. Uh, you know you just see the tip of, of the iceberg when you read a Hemingway story. It's the same thing with him. I mean, you see this guy like killing you know lions in Africa and hanging out, caping you know Spanish fighting bulls, being best friends with Belmonte and all these these amazing you know matadors. But uh, you know in reality there was so much more going on there. You know, there wasn't this, that was just a facade. That was just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, that this guy was incredibly complicated, you know, cross-dressing, you know, having all these, 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 you know, destructive relationships, you know, seriously conflicted inside a very incredibly complicated person. And the more you read his work, you know, you see that there's way more to these stories. Like, like when I, you know, when David started explaining these metaphors, you know, you, you see like, man, these are, these stories are incredibly complex. And even though they're simple sentences, you know, they're, they're deep and, and really profound, you know. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that, that really fascinates me to this day, his whole concept of masculinity and, and who he really was and, and all that. Um, the other writers that, that influenced me, um, you know, a lot of the urban realists have influenced me, you know, um, Stuart Dybeck, uh, guys like Richard Price, uh, my friend Irvin Welsh, uh, guys that, that sort of write about the urban experience, you know, because it's what I've seen and what I've lived. Um, it's, it's really, it really fascinates me and, and they've all left their mark on me. Uh, the one guy that, like for pure art's sake, the guy that really I love, that I think is the, the American master uh, of the contemporary um, era is uh, Cormac McCarthy. Um, you know, and he's, what he, in my opinion, what he did was he took the two greatest, well, arguably the two greatest American authors, Faulkner and Hemingway, and sort of combined them into this, into this really beautiful sentence that uh, is just unparalleled. And, uh, and, I, and I'm definitely a disciple of McCarthy and his, and his, uh, his art. And um, I think you can see, I've had I've, one person compared me to McCarthy, and it was in like a little blog, and like I still, that was like the greatest day of my life. Someone had, they called me like the, the Cormac McCarthy of the streets, and uh, I was very proud of that. Any other questions, guys?